Last Sunday evening, Susan and I went to Pine Knob to hear a concert by James Taylor, and a bunch of you were there. Raise your hand if you were at that concert. There were like a dozen, yes, there were like a dozen uh, St. Philip's people at that concert. We just kept bumping into people all over. Um, and I love James Taylor. The first uh, James Taylor concert I went to was in 1985 at Tanglewood in Massachusetts. And I gotta tell you, James Taylor was not a super young man even then. And he certainly is no longer young by any stretch of the imagination. And it showed at the concert his voice is not what it used to be. It cracked a lot. I don't know if he was just having a vocal issue or if it's, you know, the years catching up with him as they do with all of us at one time or another. But it was still a fantastic concert. Um, and he sang all his great old songs and many of us were singing along. It was a, a wonderful time. But it got me thinking about sort of the passing of time and these transitions that we go through in life, right? It won't be too much longer before James Taylor won't be touring anymore, is my guess, looking at him at that concert. There's been a lot of, uh, of that going around. Susan and I watched a great uh, documentary last night about Roger Federer. I don't know if you're a tennis fan, but Roger Federer may be the most beautiful tennis player ever to play the game. Uh, one of the best ever, but also just graceful in every possible way. And this was a documentary about the last 12 days before he announced his uh, retirement two years ago. And it was really moving uh, as we kind of talked about how he made that transition. How did he know when it was time to make that big change in his life? Not that he's giving up tennis, but he's giving up that level of competition. His, his knee had had like four surgeries and it just was not gonna hold up to the rigors of the ATP tour. Um, but what he did was to, you know, he's Swiss. I gotta say, there's something about the Swiss that is very meticulous. I don't mean to generalize, but think of Swiss watches, you know. So everything about Roger Federer is carefully thought out and planned, including this farewell. Uh, and it was lovely to see. One of the things that struck me was that Federer, in addition to being a fierce competitor, absolutely fierce competitor, it came out in this documentary that he had actually changed the atmosphere in the locker room. So these players all get together in the locker room before matches, and it can be kind of tense because these are all intense comp competitors and they're staring each other down and playing mind games. But Federer was able to create a sense of community among these bitter competitors. They were all crying as he made his farewell speech. Rafa, Rafa Nadal and um, even uh, uh, Djokovic, who seems like he's a robot sometimes. If, I don't know, if you're not a tennis fan, I apologize. But, but it was really moving to see that there was such deep care among these fierce competitors. So uh, Federer found a way to, to plan out this farewell in the most beautiful and touching way. And it came through, and I recommend that. Even if you're not a tennis player, it was a lovely uh, documentary. It struck me because as I think about our lessons today, we have in our Old Testament lesson um, a wonderful tribute that King David gives to his predecessor, Saul, with whom, we, let's say, he had a complicated relationship, right? Saul had raised up David and made him part of the court he had sort of made him his heir apparent. David and Saul's son, Jonathan, were the very best of friends. Um, in fact, David says, your love, Jonathan, was more to me than any other relationship I've ever had. That, that's how close they were as friends. But Saul also tried to kill David when he became a threat. Saul also, as we probably said before, had something like schizophrenia or some kind of mental problems. And so Saul had a very problematic kingship. And yet David is able in this moment to pay tribute to Saul and Jonathan, who were struck down in a war with the Philistines and killed. And he gives this moving tribute as he looks not only backward over their lives, but forward with faith and confidence 
to the future that God is leading the people of Israel into. That's what strikes me is so important as we go through these transitions in life. It's so tempting to dwell in the past, so tempting to look back either with nostalgia or with fear to what happened before and to kind of obsess about what didn't or did happen and what we're kind of stuck in that past. What's important is to have a sense of resilience, faith, and hope to be able to embrace the future that God is leading us into. Resilience is what our gospel characters had. Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, whose daughter was dying and they couldn't save her. I'm sure they went to all the doctors also, like the woman with the hemorrhage who had had that for 12 years and had bankrupted herself going to different doctors and faith healers and who knows what else. If you ever had a disease like that that's uncurable, you know you would do anything to get help and cure. And she had, she had exhausted herself from this. Her last chance was Jesus. And she thought, if only I can touch his cloak, maybe, maybe he can heal me. Just like Jairus, who was supposed to be an enemy of Jesus, the leader of the synagogue was supposed to not like Jesus at all, was supposed to reject him utterly, and yet he had the faith, the resiliency, the desperation to turn to Jesus in his moment of need. And Jesus was able, of course, to heal both his daughter and the woman with the hemorrhage. Resilience is a key element of being able to embrace the unknown future. Knowing that we have received a legacy from the past that equips us with the faith to carry on, even when we don't know how that's going to work. This past week at the General Convention in Kentucky, um, one of the, I don't know if you read about it, but there was a lot that went on, but the main thing that seemed to be the news was the election of a new presiding bishop. Now Michael Curry has been our presiding bishop for nine years. Michael Curry, who rose to global fame by preaching at the royal wedding um, and became a superstar celebrity, was on all the morning talk shows, and is a person of rare charisma, faith, and inspiration. If you've ever listened to him preach, you cannot help but be swept up in the joy and power of the Holy Spirit. And everyone wondered, what, how can anybody follow Michael Curry? Who would want to follow Michael Curry? We're just, this will be it, right? We've had this great nine years, and now it's all over. And yet that is not what happened. The House of Bishops gathered and elected, I think, a fantastic person, uh, Sean Rowe, who is the youngest presiding bishop uh, since 1789. He's 49 years old. Many clergy, let me tell you, in the Episcopal Church, don't go to seminary until they're 49. <laughs> and he's going to be our presiding bishop. He was the youngest priest ever ordained in the Episcopal Church. Then he was the youngest bishop ever consecrated. And now he's the youngest presiding bishop. But he's an old soul. If you meet him, you think he was born 65 years old. I don't know if you know people like that, but he just has this sense of of gravitas and, um, and faith and groundedness. And so I am absolutely delighted that he will be the next presiding bishop. He's not going to be another Michael Curry. He doesn't have that, you know, pizzazz. But what he has is resilience. He's been leading congregations and dioceses that have been in some of the most struggling parts of the country, the Rust Belt. His diocese are Western New York, and Northwest Pennsylvania, dioceses which have seen an exodus of people, dioceses which have struggled with the decline of industry, dioceses where people have struggled to hold on to faith. He is well equipped to tackle the issues that we all face in this modern contemporary world. And so he's able to, I think, lead us with faith and confidence into this unknown future with the legacy of the past. I want to end by saying that the other thing that gives me tremendous hope as I look to the future was reading in the epistle the short bios of our graduates. Um, seeing in these young people 
such amazing accomplishments through their high school and now college years, seeing the way they have strived to make a difference in their community, seeing their faith, their optimism, their hope, and their giftedness is to me tremendously hopeful and inspiring because it's so easy as we get older in life to sink into the mindset of things will never be as good as they were in my day. I don't know if you read this on the internet. People are like, well, you know, when I was a kid, life was good, and now life is just terrible. Have you ever seen that? I am so sick of that. That is not a godly attitude, right? The godly attitude is to know that, yes, there are new challenges that maybe we've never faced before, and yet the same God who made us and sustained us through all of the generations, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is the God who is with us now. And God is raising up new people every day to take on those challenges. New people like our new presiding bishop. New people like these amazing young graduates who will be able, with God's grace and help, to help us all tackle the challenges of the coming years. We cannot lose heart. We cannot lose faith. We can look back with gratitude to the past, but let's not live there. Let's live in the present, the present that is blessed abundantly by the God who loves us so much and gives us everything we need to carry out the ministry he has given us to do. And let's do it together. As St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, it is by sharing what we have with one another that we will be able to meet the challenges ahead. St. Paul was writing at a time when the Christians in Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus had lived and died and was raised, were starving to death from a famine. And he wrote to the Corinthians and said, let your present abundance be for their need. Together, as God's people, we can tackle even the most difficult problems. So with confidence and faith and community, I invite us to look to the future, not with despair, but with hope and faith and above all, the abundant love that God gives us and continues to pour upon us through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior.